Well, th this morning what I'd like to do is <clears throat> read the words that I alluded to earlier in the service. The words that um, are uh, essentially closing not only the book of Revelation, but essentially the Bible itself. Even though these words are meant specifically for that prophecy that was given by John, and I, I believe, or through John, I believe that, um, that this was the last book of the New Testament that was written. And it is interesting that the Lord seals the last book with this warning. Uh, and we're going to see also other examples in, in Scripture of how the Lord is, is warning us, continually warning us not to add to or to take away from His Word. So this is what um, John writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. He says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. Now again, I'll just say at the beginning, this applies to the whole Word of God, and that's what we want to see this morning. Also, that this is where the enemy attacks. He's trying to take the Word of God away from us. He's trying to distort it. He's trying to discredit it, and he does it in a variety of ways. Now, let me just back up for a moment and remind us that we have been looking at spiritual warfare, the battle that we are in as believers, uh, that we're in whether we realize it or not. It may not seem like as we're sitting here worshiping the Lord that there's a battle going on, but there actually is. It's going on in our minds, and our hearts. It's going on all around us. The enemy is working outside of us, the devil, and he's working inside of us through our corruption to try to get us not to hear what it is that he wants to tell us. But we need to realize we're in a battle, and we need to understand how to overcome what the enemy is doing against us, what the devil is doing. Now, in this particular subject, I want us to understand that we're not the only ones, as we look at the Word of God, we're not the only ones involved in this war. Unbelievers are involved in it as well, although they are, we might say, casualties of this war, at least they are currently. Satan is also attacking them. Satan is using the world against them. He's using their corruption, their flesh. He's tempting them. He's trapping them. He's trying to keep them happy so that they won't realize the situation that they're in until it's too late and they have to face God's judgment. We need to realize that if the devil who is a very real being, the Bible tells us, had his way, everyone, all of God's creatures, all of those made in his image, would suffer with him forever in hell. But since the devil can't do that because the Lord is saving people out of this world, he'll at least try to make sure that he brings as many people as he can with him to that place as possible. Now, we are going to see that the enemy is attacking the people of the world and how he does it, but we also need to understand that the way he is going to approach us is going to be a bit different than the way he approaches them, although it will be still similar. Jesus has freed us from his kingdom. We are free from his power. We are no longer in danger of God's judgment, so the devil cannot destroy us. I mean, we need to thank the Lord that he can't. Outside of Christ, we would be ruined. But the devil can affect us. He can work against us. And he does work against us to keep us from becoming like Jesus. Remember what Jesus is like. He is the one who loved his father with all of his heart and gave his life entirely to him to glorify him, to honor him, to show the world what he is like by living according to his word. And he did that because, of course, he loved his word and he wanted to honor his father. Now, Jesus did what he did. He lived and he died so that he might give us his Holy Spirit so that we might be able to live as he lived. Now, we've also seen that the more we live like Jesus, the more that we are like him, the more we love and obey like Jesus did, the greater our reward is going to be when we stand before him in heaven. That's essentially how we started this off. 
But the devil knows the more that we are like Jesus, the greater threat we're going to pose to him and to his kingdom. And that's why he wants to stop us from becoming like Jesus. Now, the main way that he does this is by tempting us, tempting us to disobey God. And he has a variety of ways of doing that. We've seen one way that he works, perhaps his main way, and that is through deception. Remember what Jesus said about the devil in John 8, 44. He is a liar and the father of lies. Satan uses deception in order to tempt us to sin. Remember what he did to Eve. When he came to Eve, he questioned what God said. Did God really say, you shouldn't eat of that tree? Injecting doubt, of course, in her mind. He tried to confuse her about what God said by broadening the commandment. Did God say that you couldn't eat from any of the trees? He questioned whether God would actually carry out what he had threatened. No, God's too loving. God is too gracious. He won't kill you. You surely will not die. That's actually a, a tactic the enemy uses every day. You, there's no hell. God's not, if there is a God, he's not going to send you to hell. God is a God of love. He's not going to send anyone to hell. I've heard people say that. They believe that because that's a deception of the enemy. You surely will not die. And Satan questioned the penalty that God had given, turning it into a blessing instead. It was no longer... In the day that you eat, you will die. But in the day you eat from this tree, you will be like God. Satan deceived Eve into thinking that doing what God told her not to do was actually a good thing. It was a good thing to do. And so she ate of that tree and she gave to Adam and he ate of the tree. And all of us were ruined because of that deception. Now, Satan does the same thing today. He tries to tempt us to sin through deception by twisting God's words. But remember the defense that we have against that. The same defense that Jesus used when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. In Matthew 4.4, 4, he said this to the enemy. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, Jesus didn't mean by that that we eat the word like physical food, but what he means is if you want to be safe from the enemy of your souls, you will read the word of God and you will stick to the path that it lays out ahead of you. Now, Satan knows how important the Bible is, and that is why he continually attacks it. If, if he can take the sword out of our hands, remember the sword of the Spirit, will not only lose a means of defense, remember a sword was used to deflect blows as well as to give them, but we'll also lose our only means of offense against the enemy. We need to hang on to the sword of the Spirit. So today I want us to consider two more ways that the enemy tries to disarm us, two more ways he tries to take the sword out of our hands. The first is by trying to distort or discredit the Bible by adding to it or taking away from it. I mean, he deceives us as far as what it says, but he also likes to remove certain portions and add certain things to it. Now, that's what we want to look at this morning. The second deception or way he tries to keep us, uh, take the Word of God away from us is by taking away our love for the Word of God so that we don't want to read what it says. That's what we're going to look at this evening. So this morning, let's consider this, that the devil is working hard to try to undermine our confidence in the Word of God. He's trying to destroy the Word of God by, again, distorting it, by changing it. Satan attacks what we call the inspiration of the Bible. Remember the meditation that we saw? All Scripture is inspired by God. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Every word is exactly uh, what he intends it to be. It's exactly what he wants to say. Now, it's precisely because the Bible is his word that John warns us what he does in the text that we read of this morning regarding adding to the prophecy or taking away. Let me just read it again to make sure that we have it fresh in our minds. 
He writes, I testify to everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. Let me just say this. I don't think God has in mind here, John has in mind, somebody who may accidentally misinterpret the Bible, misinterpret what John meant to say, but people who maliciously do this, who add to it and take it away because they want to distort what the Word of God says. But the point is, God does not take the changing of His Word lightly. He does not take the changing of this prophecy lightly or any of His Word. Now, we see this warning really shot throughout Scripture. We read in Deuteronomy 4.2 where Moses writes this, You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Do not add to it. Do not take away from it. Do what I tell you to do. He writes in 12 verse 32 of Deuteronomy, Whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to nor take away from it. And then Agur, who is one of the uh, later writers of the uh, book of Proverbs, remember? There was Lemuel and Agur as well as Solomon. Solomon writes the bulk of it, but these two write at the end. He writes in Proverbs 30, verse 6, Do not add to his words, or he will reprove you, and you will be proved a liar. We already saw in our scripture reading this morning the warning that Jesus gave to the Jewish leaders who were changing the Word of God by adding their traditions and by so doing taking away from the Word of God by nullifying one of the commandments. His response to them was this, you hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. What they should be doing is teaching the Word of God. But instead, they're teaching their precepts. They are negating the Word of God, hiding it from the people of God, injuring the people of God. Now, what Jesus is warning us against here, what John is warning us against, what God is warning us against in, throughout Scripture, this is exactly what the enemy does. He tries to destroy the Word of God by adding to it or taking away from it. Now, as I said before, he does this with unbelievers as well as believers. This is one of the ways that he keeps unbelievers from discovering the truth. I mean, consider how it is he works in false religions. Uh, let's begin with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Charles Taze Russell, who is the founder of what's called the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, which he actually founded in order to create tracts and print tracts and distribute tracts so that other people would come to know the good message that, that he believed. Well, I'm afraid he didn't believe the truth, so it became a very dangerous organization. But that is Jehovah's Witnesses. That's how they were founded. Now, he began by creating what he considered to be a more accurate translation of the Bible from the original languages, at least he claims, called the New World Translation. And in this translation, he tried to eliminate a very important truth of Christianity, and that is every reference to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why that particular doctrine? Why that particular teaching? It's because we need to believe that in order to be saved. Jesus said to the Jews on one occasion in John 8, verse 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Now, if you had your Bibles open, you were looking at this, you would probably find that the word He is in italics, which means it's not in the original text. It's added by the translators. The word isn't actually there. What Jesus is saying is this, unless you believe that I am you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am the eternally existing one, that I am Yahweh, the covenant Lord of Israel. You can't be saved. 
Now, we have to trust the true Jesus. We have to trust the true Savior in order to be saved. I've mentioned this before. Just because a person or maybe somebody we're describing has the name of Jesus does not mean that that is the Jesus who saves. Jesus is a very common name in in the Hispanic community, Jesus, right? And if you trust in the Jesus who drives a taxi down in Tijuana, that's not going to save you because that isn't the right Jesus, obviously. Well, if you trust in a Jesus that isn't God, you're also not trusting in the Jesus who saves because that's who he is. Now, Satan knows that, and that's why he tries to hide it. By the way, let me just mention that Russell was, was put on trial in his day, and he was asked to prove that he, that he knew the original languages. He was asked to prove that he knew Greek, but he wasn't able to do something as simple as reciting the Greek alphabet when he was asked by the lawyer. Now, as you know, just learning the English language, what's the very last thing that you're going to forget when it comes to the English language? It's going to be the alphabet. That's what you were you know, taught at the very beginning when you were learning the language. That's the last thing you're probably going to forget. So what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that Russell didn't know Greek. He didn't know Hebrew either, but he wouldn't admit it. He was deceived and he was used by the devil to deceive others. He was, we should say, deceiving as well as being deceived. Now think about the Mormons. The Mormons also claim to be the true church of Jesus Christ. They believe the church became corrupted, but God restored it through a prophet by the name of Joseph Smith. And not surprisingly, Joseph Smith, as well as other prophets in the Mormon church, also made revisions to the Bible. They did it by, first of all, adding what they call another testament of Jesus Christ, which is the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith claims to have translated it from a series of golden tablets. Uh, And it's a very lengthy book, these tablets. There have to be a lot of these tablets. Through the use of these magic spectacles from reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics, which only he could read by putting these glasses on, and he was shown the tablets and the glasses by an angel who used to be a man but is now an angel by the name of Moroni. So... I think it was perhaps the man who wrote this revelation, or at least parts of it, and then hid it, waiting for somebody to find it or to show it to somebody so they could translate it. So they have taken this to be another testament of Jesus Christ. And, of course, they've added other writings by Smith and other prophets as well. But what about the Bible? Well, everything that they've written overrides the Bible. They believe that the Bible is only true when it doesn't contradict what it is their prophets are saying. And they say, in as far as it is correctly translated, and it is correctly translated only when it agrees with the teachings of their church. Well, what do they believe? Well, what don't they believe? It's perhaps more important. They deny the Trinity. They believe the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are three separate gods. They deny monotheism. They believe there are an infinite number of gods in the universe and that, or in existence, and that these gods were all once just men, people like us, who became gods of their own planet through their works. They deny that we are justified or saved by grace through faith alone, believing that all we need to do is be baptized in the Mormon church to be saved. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to be baptized while you're alive. Mormons who live today can be baptized on behalf of people who died a long time ago, and they can be saved in that way. Now, believing in a false god who saves through baptism can't save you, but it will destroy you. And that's exactly what Satan wants, which is why he has deceived them in this way. Islam falls into the same category. Islam, again, believes it's the only true religion. Islam accepts parts of the Bible, oddly enough, the Torah, five books of Moses, the Psalms, and they accept one gospel, but not any of the four that are in the New Testament. Rather, a revelation given to the the prophet Jesus, and they believe Jesus was merely a man, merely a prophet, that might have been recorded, might have been written down, might still exist, or may not have been written down, doesn't really matter. So they only accept parts of the Bible. Again, Satan takes away. 
and they have added to it another revelation, which is called the Quran, which they believe God gave through their prophet Muhammad. Now, Islam, again, denies the Trinity. Islam denies the deity of Jesus Christ. Islam denies justification by grace through faith alone. All of these things are necessary to be saved. If you believe as Islam believes, you will be destroyed, and that's exactly what Satan wants. Now, as we move through other movements, Satan has also been at work in the Roman church. They also believe they're the only true church. They accept the Bible as the Word of God, but they have added to the Word of God. They added the Apocrypha, additional books at the Council of Trent in the 1500s. They've added the tradition of the early church, which they believe was preserved in the fathers. They've added the decisions of ecumenical councils. They've added the, uh, whatever the Pope believes in his particular day as he speaks from his office, from the chair of Peter on matters of faith and morals. All of these things they call the traditions, which are continually developing. And they have added it to Scripture, and as a result, of course, they've added many things which are dangerous. But they deny something that is very important, and that is that we are justified by grace through faith alone. They believe that there are certain things that we have to do, works we have to do to receive God's grace. So they have misinterpreted the Bible by adding to the Bible. Sometimes the enemy works even more completely than this. Sometimes he, he gets rid of the Bible completely. Liberalism was a movement in the church um, years ago, and it still exists today, that denies the supernatural. There is no such thing as a miracle. And so there cannot be a supernatural origin to the Bible. It is simply the writings of men. They don't believe in a Jesus who is literally the Son of God. They believe that if we're going to understand who Jesus is, we need to get into the Word and peel back the layers of tradition that have been you know, grown up all around this person of Jesus Christ to see who he really was. And so the, the purpose of the pastor is to get past all this legend and myth and get down to the real Jesus. Well, you know, atheism is essentially the same thing as liberalism. The only difference is they don't have the Christian veneer. Liberalism is atheism with a Christian veneer. Uh, Neo-Orthodoxy, which was a reaction against liberalism, didn't do much better when they said the Bible is not the Word of God, but it contains the Word of God. And how do you know which part of it is the Word of God? Well, when you read it and it speaks to you, that part is the Word of God. It becomes the Word of God to you. Salvation, in their view, is having this personal encounter with God through His Word. That's how you get saved, by seeing something of God's Word in His Word. Again, Satan hides the truth by taking the Bible away. Now, he's also at work within the true church trying to distort and discredit the Bible by adding to it and taking away from it. And here I'll begin to tread on some more toes, I think. He's convinced some within the church, even from very early on in the church, if you've been going through the church history series with uh, Bob Godfrey on Wednesdays, uh, that the charismatic gifts are actually continuing and that God is still communicating to us, still giving inspiration through prophecy, through tongues, and through the word of knowledge. Now, some are so extreme in their belief that they, won't, they will no longer accept anything that the Bible says. There, there are people like this as coming from God unless it comes through one of these ways. It has to come through prophecy. has to come through tongues or interpretation of those tongues. It has to come through a word of knowledge. They say the Word of God was God's Word for a previous generation, for a previous people, but we need a fresh Word of God today, and that's exactly what He gives us. Let me give you an example of that very thing happening. Uh, there, there was a pastor, he's still a pastor in our denomination, he used to be the pastor of the San Francisco Church, Chuck McElhaney, uh, who, with his wife Donna, were persecuted. They were persecuted by some of the homosexual community, in San Francisco because they fired uh, somebody who was playing one of their musical instruments, an organ, I think, when they discovered that, that he was a practicing homosexual. So it brought all this ire against them, firebombing, death threats, protests in front of the church every single Lord's Day. Uh, a lot of things happened, but one of the things that happened was he wrote a book. And 
some who saw this book wanted to interview him, and he was invited one time to come down to Australia and be invited or, or to be interviewed on Christian television in Australia. Now, Donna McElhaney, his wife, said that she was conversing with some of the, the people who were in the studio. If you know anything about Christian TV, you know that it's pretty much controlled by the Charismatics, you know, the, the Pentecostals. Uh, they have the money, and they're able to, to fund this kind of thing. So Donna said she was speaking with one of the ladies there, and this woman that she was speaking with, when, when Donna tried to show her something from the Bible, she just looked somewhat bewildered and, and wouldn't accept it, and she would always reply, God told me this, but Donna would say, well, this is what the Bible says, but, but God told me this, and then when Donna caught on to what it was she was saying, she began to say, well, the Lord told me this, and then began to paraphrase what the Bible said, and then the gal accepted it. They only accept what comes through special revelation, inspiration that's ongoing. Now, if that's not true of the whole charismatic movement. That's not what I'm saying. But you can see the problem is this, that anyone who claims to be inspired is adding to God's Word, even if that's not what they're intending on doing. And most of them will say, no, I wouldn't, you wouldn't write this down and put it in the Bible. But if that's God's Word... That's what you should do, and that's the problem. You shouldn't because it isn't God's Word. Now, these words that they add can have the effect of taking away from what God teaches in His Word. Uh, in a church that I was a part of many years ago, what we affectionately call health and, and wealth churches, it was a church I went to from age 12 to about 17. The messages the pastor got, and he got messages every Lord's Day, all had to do either with money or with healing. If it was money, the message was this, God wants to give to you, but he can't because you need to give to him first. So give your money and then God will give to you. We heard that just about every Lord's Day. Or they had to do with healings. If you have enough faith, God will heal you. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, for one thing, that's not what the Bible teaches. Second thing is, if you're focused on money, if you're giving to God in order for God to give back to you and your, your ultimate goal is to become rich and have the things of this world, that teaching is drawing your heart into the world rather than placing it on God. Hasn't the Lord chosen those who are poor to be rich? Isn't that what the Bible teaches? But they're promoting wealth. Now the second, God will heal you if you have enough faith, encouraged us to stay away from doctors. And I know at least one man who was suffering from some rare tropical disease who refused to go to the doctor and he died because of that teaching. Now, that's a problem. When we add to the Word of God or take away from the Word of God, we're telling God what to say rather than listening to what it is He said. We need to listen to Him. We need to follow Him. Now, we may not have that problem in, in this church, I mean, we're, we're not a charismatic church. You probably noticed that in the form of worship that, we're, that we have. Um, we, we don't have special messages. We're, we're not looking anywhere for, for God's Word except in, in the Word of God. But there are ways that we too can be tempted to add to or take away from God's Word. Now, let me just close on this point. The devil is working to try to tempt us, first of all, to believe one of the deceptions that we considered earlier. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they come to your door, don't they? Whether you open the door or not, I mean, that, that's, that's perhaps another matter. But we really ought to pray about, you know, confronting them because very, very few people actually do. Mormons come to your door as well. Do you realize that many who uh, are in those organizations today started out in a Bible-believing church? Many Jehovah's Witnesses were once Trinitarians, believe that, but Jehovah's Witnesses convinced them that that was not true. They were swept into a cult because they were listening to them and not to what the Word of God says. They weren't grounded. Satan may tempt us in other ways. He may tempt us to take good principles and perhaps apply them in a wrong direction. Now, this is one that's very popular today, so I thought I would bring it up. We know that if we are to understand the Bible, we need to understand or to know what it meant to the original audience. What, what did they hear 
when the word of God was actually read by them or, or spoken to them. And once we understand what it meant to them, how they understood it, then we can apply it to our situation. By the way, that doesn't drastically alter anything that the Bible teaches regarding morals, but we do need, there is obviously some sense in which we need to understand how it, had, it registered in the ears of somebody living in the Jewish culture. Now, some have taken this principle as a way of changing what the Word of God actually says. Uh, God said what he said, this is what they would say, God said what he said because of the culture of that day, but he would not say that today. Now, that argument is used to try to, to do a workaround uh, homosexuality. You know, there are, there are home, practicing homosexuals who are going to Christian churches, or at least so-called Christian churches, saying that God made me this way, this is okay. I can live this way and still be accepted by God, still be loved by God, still go to heaven, even though the Bible clearly says that isn't the case. Well, that was just a matter of the culture. You see, they wouldn't accept it in that day, but today we do accept it, and so now today it's okay. Another uh, thing that this is usually used against is a very touchy subject, not politically correct, so brace yourself. Women should not be pastors and elders. You know, it's what the Bible teaches. What they say is that was the Jewish culture. They had a lower view of women. They treated them like slaves. They treated them like dogs. Uh, we shouldn't take what they thought and apply it to today. The same isn't true today. But we need to realize that when we read the Bible and we hear Paul saying this, he's not saying it because of their view of women. And by the way, they had a very high view of women. God had a very high view of women. They're equal with men. Men are to love and cherish their wives. They are to be servants to their wives. There, there's no inequality. There's just a difference of function. And when Paul says what he says about the offices... He doesn't ground it in the culture. He grounds it instead on the fall, which is interesting. And he says, Eve was the one who was deceived. It wasn't Adam. And that's why God does not call women to be elders, perhaps because the propensity to be deceived might be a bit higher. And why? We can only speculate. Perhaps it's because we think differently. Okay? But again... We need to, to listen to what the Bible says. Now, the culture has an influence on what the Bible is actually saying. It does dictate what God addresses in His Word, but it doesn't dictate the morality of the Word. The situation may change. It's changing all the time. But the principles that God gives to us, they always remain the same. Now, why do I believe that? Well, it's because that's what Jesus said. Listen to what he says in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, in Matthew's Gospel, verses 17 through 19. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Now, if we stop there... Many uh, Bible interpreters, pastors and churches today would say what Jesus is saying here is that when I fulfilled this, it all passed away. You don't have to do it anymore. It's all been accomplished. But that's not what Jesus was saying, and we know that because of what he says next. Listen to what he says. Whoever then annuls, you know, considers as nothing, sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. What did Jesus do? He kept them and he taught them. He was great in the kingdom of heaven. He is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And that is the example he calls us to follow. Now notice what he said again, whoever annuls even the least of one of these commandments, the moral principles remain the same even though the applications may change according to the culture. The principles are always the same. Now, again, that's a deception the enemy uses. We need to make sure we stick to the Word of God. Finally, the devil can tempt us in another way, and that is 
to stay out of the Bible and to build our belief system, not on what the Bible says, but on what other people say the Bible says. Uh, Satan wants us to have a designer Christianity, a designer religion, to make a religion of our own, to listen to what people say and you say, I like that or I don't like that. And so I'll choose what I want to add, I'll choose what I want to exclude, and I'll just basically create a religion of my own. Well, that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. Create a religion of your own rather than embracing the one that God gave. What did the Bereans do when Paul the Apostle preached the gospel to them? They examined the scriptures to see whether what he was saying was really what God said. That is what we need to do. Now, Satan knows that he cannot destroy us. At the very least, he's going to weaken us. But he cannot destroy us if we belong to Jesus. But again, if we want to be safe, if we want to be productive, if we want um, you know, to be able to carry out what the Lord actually calls us to carry out, if we want to grow into the image of Jesus Christ, we need to live not by you know, these designer religions that, that the enemy has come up with, not by our own designer religion. We need to live by what God actually says in his word. Not what we want him to say, but what he actually says. We have no right to tamper with the word of God. It is God's word. We need to listen to it. We need to do it. Do not add to it. Do not take away from it. Simply accept what he says. Read what he says. Apply what he says, and you will be safe, and you will be productive. You will become more like Jesus. Now, tonight, we're going to consider the second attack that's connected to this attack. The devil is still going to come against us to try to keep us away from the Word of God, and we're going to see how he does that. We already know how he does it because we have experience in that area. Just think about how easy it is to read, how much you read it every day. How much do you read it? It isn't that easy. And it's because there is an attack by the enemy against you to keep you out of the Word. If he can't distort the Word of God in your eyes, he's going to at least try to keep you away from it so that you will not be able to move forward in your growth in Christ's likeness. So I would encourage you to come back this evening as we can take up that particular issue. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, um, let's ask the Lord to apply what we've just heard. And then um, after the prayer, we're going to just spend a couple of minutes preparing to come to the table, and then we'll celebrate the table. So let's begin to prepare for that as well.